pursue a bachelor's of ayurvedic medicine and surgery degree from chennai her area of specialization is biomedical nmr radio frequency call designing and building radio frequency pulse sequence programming clinical imaging and spectroscopy neuroscience applications of mr she has wide experience in both experimental and clinical mri and spectroscopy she developed indigenously a low cost rf transmitter receiver coil for clinical use for which she is received she has received the young scientist award during her stint as a visiting professor at the max planck institute of biophysical chemistry in germany she worked on functional mrs techniques she has a number of research publications awards and honors to her credit using her vantage point as a physicist and an ayurvedic physician she is currently involved in scientific research in ayurveda its concepts methods pharmacology and clinical practices using nmr mri and a number of analytic analytical techniques she is also actively engaged in dissemination of knowledge of the science behind ayurveda today she is delivering the keynote on the topic women scholars of india vedic sangam to pre independent era over to the speaker oh hello good morning everybody am i audible yes professor okay um and please my uh, ppt see Yes, uh, not yet in full screen mode though. Yes, now it is visible. Is it in full screen mode now? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So good morning, everyone, and it gives me great pleasure to not only join you all on line, uh, but also uh, share some of my thoughts on this very loaded, exciting, and interesting topic of women scholars of uh, uh, India. pre-independent india uh and i thank indias and uh, dr ramanathan in particular for inviting me uh, for this lecture and as you can see from the uh, title i am taking a very wide sweep uh you know in time you know from uh, uh, pre-independent back to sangam period to vedic period so there are some fundamental questions about uh, uh what is scholarship and who can be called scholars uh, and uh, i'm not going to go into the details of it but uh, uh let me just tell you that there are two types of scholarships so one talks of acquired scholarship then there are unschooled scholars you know who are self taught unschooled but and with native intelligence and then there is also applied scholarship so let us look quickly at the difference between these kind of uh, scholarships when you talk of acquired scholarship one talks of obtaining a institutional qualification and taking up organized careers like you know a scientist or a historian or a economist or a medical professional and so on now some of these scholars may be from privileged class for example if you talk of days bygone the queens people from the royal family they would come from the privileged class and also if you talk of contemporary time daughters born of educated parents can also will also fall into this category of privileged class now some may have to fight against social norms and uh, they are from unprivileged class but all have one thing in common which is all have the inclination or thirst for knowledge when you talk of unschooled uh, scholars and scholars with native intelligence they do not have any formal education or training but they have native intelligence they have a inherent thirst for knowledge and most of them are self taught there are many many examples dotted in the history of uh, our own country queens like abakka and naika devi who were great warriors who were great warrior strategists and who were great administrators they did not have any formal training and commoners like shakuntala and ramanujam who were great mathematicians again you know uh, they did not uh, get a bsc msc and a phd in mathematics but they had native intelligence and they were using with the, uh, this native intelligence so what are the sources of information we can uh, think of to get uh, 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 information about uh, women scholars uh, across the vast period of time 
So one can look at ancient monuments with inscriptions, uh, monoliths, stone tablets, uh, metal plates, paintings, icons, uh, uh, friezes, uh, frescoes, sculptures, etc. There is also indigenous literature, a vast amount of literature available in Sanskrit, Tamil and vernaculars. I have made a special mention of Sanskrit and Tamil because the most ancient literature and information is available in these two languages. Uh, one can also look at literature from other countries. Let us not forget that in days bygone, uh, India was a, not only a cultural center, it was also a center for education. Students were coming from all over the world to study uh, in India and they were going back, they went back to the country. So literature from other countries can also be a very good source of information, travelers, memoirs, and out, out of the, uh, outside the uh, literary uh, works, you know, uh, popular conception, folklore, proverbs, these can also uh, contribute uh, some information. So what is fascinating about the lives of these women, women scholars are some of them gave up comforts for knowledge. Some of them remained unmarried uh, for, uh, for acquiring knowledge. Some of them were scholars, but they remained householders. Some of them were uh, queens and then they were scholars. Some of them were queens and they were warrior queens and they remained scholars. Some broke tradition left, right and center to acquire knowledge. And uh, many of them, at least in the examples that I am giving, you will find that many of them were encouraged by men. They were encouraged or schooled by their fathers, stepfathers, father-in-laws, husbands, and teachers. So there are, uh, I'm sure all of us know, would have heard of uh, at least some of these scholars, but there are many whom we do not know. And what I'm going to do today is touch upon the lives of some of the many whom we do not know. So I am going to move backwards uh, from 20th century back to, uh, you know, uh, the Sankam period and then to the Vedic period, both of which fall in the BCE. So if you look at the 19th, 20th century, it was a great time of churning for women. So a lot of exciting things were happening uh, uh, in the country uh, and women were drawn into it. Women were drawn into education, formal education. They were drawn into activism. They were drawn into politics. They were drawn into freedom fight. And you can see some of the names here. This is not a complete list, but this is just a sample. You can see doctors, physicists, chemists, biochemists, biologists, engineers, architects, mathematicians, uh, lawyers, and the educationists and scholars. And you can see the name of uh, Savitri Boy Kule here, and uh, many, many writers and poets. So uh, we are, I will, uh, talk about a couple of them, not too many, because there is uh, not much time. But some of these people whom I was personally uh, very, very uh, inspired by. And so the first is the Rukma Bai. She was the, she was the, the first uh, uh, woman doctor uh, uh, in India. I would say woman allopathic medical doctor, because there are prior to her, there have been uh, women Ayurvedic doctors. So she is, I would say that she is the first woman allopathic doctor uh, in India and uh, her uh, life is very interesting. She was, she got married at the age of 11, but even at that age, she resisted tradition. Uh, so in a very, very unconventional understanding, she got her husband to stay with her family after marriage to complete his education. At the same time, she also continued her studies and her stepfather was a great support uh, for her education. She graduated in 1894 from the London School of Medicine for Women. I think it's very amazing that uh, in the uh, in 19th century she had gone, after having been married and she had gone to uh, London to take up a degree in medicine and she served as the chief medical officer in Surat and then in Rajput till she retired in 1929. Now, the second person I would like to talk about is Pandita Ramabai. Uh, her original name is Rama. And uh, the boy is uh, added as a mark of respect. And she was given Pandita a uh, title by the Sanskrit scholars in Northern India. She was a free soul. 
and uh, she was a sanskrit scholar but she broke every rule and tradition in the uh, in the books she had a very unconventional marriage and very soon she was widowed and uh, with a daughter and so she was a single uh, she was a widow and a single mother as well she fought for admission of women to medical colleges in india so when i say medical colleges these are western medical colleges Bulletin women were not uh, uh, allowed uh, to uh, take Haan. admission there so and she was the first one to nahin. fight jada for uh, admission of women to these medical to... colleges uh, but she went to uk in 1883 uh, believe me she went with her little baby to achha study achha medicine achha. there and uh, she had admission for medicine there but uh at the last minute she changed her plans and she enrolled herself in a teaching program and she took up the course of widows and she studied uh, in uk and also usa and she gave lectures uh, not only in india but also in japan and australia okay chalo now the other uh, uh, the next one i would like to talk about is uh, nagaratnamma she was called uh, uh, bengaluru nagaratnamma she was a scholar musician she was uh, uh, born in the family of potisins uh, and uh, she was a scholar musician she was a scholar in sanskrit music and dance she was very proficient in uh, uh, kannada english and telugu she published a number of books on poetry anthologies and anthologies she was a linguist who gave discourses in several languages she was an activist she fought for a women's place in musical concerts because during her time women were not allowed to perform in public performance and she was the first one to uh, fight for this then uh, then i would like to me- uh, mention about viva choudhury uh, there are many especially is that of viva choudhury uh, she was a unsung brilliant physicist who probably should have got nobel prize she was the first indian woman to get a phd in physics she got her phd from manchester for her work on cosmic rays uh, under the supervision of uh, professor blackett who got nobel prize for his work on cosmic rays it's not clear how much of uh, viva's work contributed to him getting the nobel prize she was the first woman who worked in the field of high energy physics she made significant contributions towards the discovery of pi mesons and published three consecutive articles in nature very commendable uh, in those times uh, and sir powell he also made the same discovery on pi mesons a few years later and he got the nobel prize whereas viva uh, should have got the nobel prize for discovering pi mesons So she was a visiting uh, researcher at the University of Michigan in 1954 and she used to teach physics in French and uh, very sadly she never received any recognition in India i think even if i am right even insa did not recognize this great physicist she died in 1991 and her uh, she was a researcher uh, till her death and her last publication appeared in 1990 now let us move a bit for the back uh, let us look at uh, what kind of women scholars that produced uh, you know this 16 to 18th century uh, ce so here we uh, come across more of poets and philosophers and uh, uh, so you can see poets saints like meera bai ganga mata goswamini and bakina bai uh, there are a number of poets and uh, this is only this is not a exhaustive list you can see the name of uh, uh, tirumalambika chandravati haba kakun from kashmir and also madhura bani rupa bhavani again from uh, kashmir uh, the scholar uh, queen warrior queen velu nachiya and the scholar vedantin called avudai akkal from a uh, region called chengottai in uh, uh, tamil nadu so i would like to uh, talk about uh, uh, chandravati Uh, 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 you know she was a poetess from bengal and uh, she is a very very interesting uh, uh, character and very uh, she was a feminist to the core she was born in kishore ganj which is now in bangladesh you can see the map in the map the inset i have shown her birthplace uh, the where the region she was born she is considered the first woman poet in bengal her father 
taught her to read, write, and master the rules of literature and poetry. She was a scholar in Sanskrit. There were many significant works of literature done by her. Her poems echoed uh, universal concerns affecting the society and especially concerns of women. And she challenged the societal norms through storytelling. Her woman centric Ramayana is very, very famous. And you can see in the picture in the left side that it has been translated now into English. Um, and it, this Ramayana, of course, is widely narrated even today. And uh, unconventionally, the story begins not with the birth of Rama, but with the birth of Sita, an introduction of Kaikeyi. And uh, in, in her Ramayana, she has positioned Sita as the central figure in the epic. There are other known feminist narratives uh, uh, which she had written, Sundari Malva and uh, Dasyu Kenaram. And uh, she was a feminist to the core. She stands her individuality at the very outset. Her work is never dedicated to the king as was the custom then, but uh, it's always to her female companions. Paragonda Venkamamba, she was another very, uh, uh, you know, uh, scholarly poetess. And she was born in Tarikonda village in Andhra Pradesh. I have again tried to show uh, the uh, region where she was born in the map uh, shown here. She was a child widow, but she refused to dress as a widow. She continued to dress as a married woman. <clears throat> and she studied yoga after she became a widow. She studied yoga under the Acharya Subramanyudu. She, fa she faced a lot of resentment from local priests, so she shifted to Tirumala, and uh, where she was received with great respect. She wrote many poems in different genres, like the Yakshaganam, Dripada Kavyam, Padya Prabandham, and Padya Pruti. Padya Pruti. At least 17 works have been credited to her, and you can see that the government of India had, uh, uh, had acknowledged her through this stamp, which was released in 2017. Very much here, she was a scholar, warrior, queen in Tamil Nadu. So when you uh, come across uh, these, some of these stories, some of them are, uh, uh, they move you, they move you to tears when you see the kind of problems uh, and hurdles that women went through, had to go through to pursue knowledge. Some of them were are, are inspiring, and some of them give you goosebumps. The story of Velu Nachiar is one which, which is awe-inspiring and at the same time it gives you good bumps. And she is a very, uh, she is not known uh, outside Tamil Nadu. Uh, in fact, I mean, although the government of India has again, uh, you know, released a stamp in our honor, and I don't even know how many people from Tamil Nadu know about her. She was born to the king of Ramnathapuram. And you can see it in the map where exactly this region comes in Tamil Nadu. She was a, a, a scholar in several languages, Tamil, Telugu, Malayalam, English, French, Urdu, and also Persian. She was a scholar in Sangam literature, which is the ancient Tamil literature, and said to have penned some works as well. She was also a scholar of warfare. She was a great war strategist. And she, trained, she was trained in horse riding, archery, martial arts like Valeri and Silambam. She married the prince of Shivaganga and she became the queen of Shivaganga. But uh, her husband was killed by British in 1772. And she had to flee from the British. And who were trying to capture her, she, uh, she escaped with her uh, little baby uh, on horseback. And at that time, she vowed to defeat the British. And uh, she got the support from Hyder Ali, who was the ruling Mysore. And she met Hyder Ali in person, and she conversed with him in chase Urdu. And Hyder Ali was so impressed with her uh, uh, speech uh, in Urdu and with her perseverance and bravery. And he gave an unconditional support uh, to Velunachia. She also got the support of uh, other uh, kings near her kingdom. But uh, to defeat the British, she did not take uh, any help from either Ali for any other people. She planned a brilliant uh, a coup and uh, she planned a suicide attack uh, uh, on the British ammunition storage to unarm the British completely. So this probably is the first, uh, uh, you know, suicide bomber, uh, you know, in the history of the world and in the history of India. 
Of course, she was not a suicide bomber. One of her uh, commander in chief called Puyili. She was just 24 years old, and she was the uh, suicide bomber. And she blew up the entire British garrison. And uh, after this, she also built an all uh, women army and named it Udayal. After her adopted daughter, she also had a biological daughter. Uh, and she was the first one to defeat British in India 77 years before the first war of independence and uh, many years before uh, uh, Jan Sirani Lakshmi Bai as well. She was the first uh, queen to revolt against British in India and uh, she developed heart problem in 1793 and Josias Dupre uh, took her to France for uh, heart operation. Let us remember that she was very, very conversant and a scholar in French as well. In France, in France, where she went for treatment, she participated uh, in, in, uh, in the protest programs of politics. This was the time of French Revolution and also gave very important uh, strategic suggestions. She died on 25th December 1796 in Virupakshi. Now, let us uh, move even further back. Let us look at the 12th to 15th century CE. Uh, you can see that the list has in the bit, it doesn't mean that there were not women scholars. It only means that I did not have time to, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, get more information. So we talk about uh, there are Akka Mahadevi from Karnataka, uh, Lal Dev, uh, a Shaivite scholar from uh, Kashmir, uh, Ganga Devi, a scholar queen, and the poetess uh, from Andhra Pradesh called Molla. And I will uh, uh, say something about Ganga Devi, uh, the poet uh, historian Queen. She was born in Varangal in Andhra Pradesh. You can again see the, uh, uh, um, the map here. Uh, on the left, you can see the uh, Vijayanagar Empire. And her husband was Kumara Kampanna, the two who ruled from Kanchipuram. And I have shown where Kanchipuram is in the map. He ruled from Kanchipuram. Uh, between 1343 and 1379, see, as a representative prince of Vijayanagar Empire, she was a highly educated and a scholarly and a very talented woman. She was a scholar in Sanskrit and Telugu. She wrote the Sanskrit poem Madhura Vijayam, which means uh, uh, the conquest of Madurai. And this her work is also called Veera Kamparaya Charita. This poem is a historical epic, a war chronicle describing in very minute details the invasion and conquest of the Madurai uh, uh, Sultanate by Kampanna in 1361 CE. You can see the, on the left, you can see the publication of this book in 1924. This work of hers uh, is praised as the first, she is praised as the first historian of South India, like Palkana of Raja Tarangini. This work is considered to have very high poetical merit. The work is in the form of classical kavya. It is in fact uh, uh, said to be written under the style called Vaidhavi style, conforming to the rules uh, laid down in the treatises on poetic, poetics and it's called a Mahakavya. So this was of course Queen Ganga Devi came from a very privileged class and although she could have also relaxed and you know, had a, a more easier time, uh, uh, you know, uh, she chose to pursue, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 a scholarly, she had a scholarly bent of mind and in fact she accompanied her husband to the war print and that's how, you know, she had the, it's the first hand information she was giving about the war. Now, Athaburi Mulla is a commoner, her father was a potter. Uh, she, is, she was born in Gopavaram, north of Nellu in Andhra Pradesh. And uh, you can see that uh, in 2017, uh, government of India had honored her by releasing a stamp and also the uh, first day cover where uh, she is also uh, uh, named. Atapuri Mulla, here you can see on the, the lower uh, uh, you know, figure, picture. The earliest and perhaps the greatest of the Telugu poet uh, was Athapuri Mulla. And her Ramayan is a poem of poetic excellence and literary merit. Her book has a pen pictures of Ravana, Hanuman, and Sita. Now, let us move even further back, uh, 8th to 11th century CE. Uh, 
you can uh, so there is a mention of Hana. She is also known as Shana uh, around the 9th century CE. And uh, Leela Bhatti uh, is mentioned as a mathematician. Of course, there are some people, historians, who say that she was not a mathematician. There are some who say that she was a mathematician. Then Avanti Sundari, the poet, poet is under rhetorician. And poet is Queen Shila Patarika and Prabhu Devi and Prabhu Saraswati and a whole lot of others. So let us look at uh, what kind of information we have about Shana. She was associated with the village of Dulia, which is in West Bengal, and the legends place her as the first female mathematician and astrologer in Bengal. She was a self-taught. She was not. Uh, she did not have an institutional education or a, a education under a guru. She was self-taught and she was uh, she was naturally gifted, and her na knowledge of astronomy was par excellence, and it won her great reputation. Her insights and predictions were, uh, you know, her knowledge of astronomy was used for common people. Uh, so she gave predictions on weather and agriculture, and these have been passed over centuries uh, through uh, Kanar Bachan. Her words and wisdom still live on as popular proverbs and uh, it's quoted till date in rural Bangladesh. Next, we go on to Avanti Sundari. She was a princess, she was a poetess, she was a rhetorician. And uh, she lived probably somewhere between 888-85 and 945 CE. She was an exceptionally accomplished scholarly woman. She lived in the kingdom of Gujara Pratihara. You can see it in the map, you know, the extent of this kingdom during 980. And uh, she was a scholar in Sanskrit and Prakut. She was the wife of Rajashekara, who says in his work on Pavya uh, Mimamsa, that scholarly poetic ability and geniusness is not based on gender. So he says that intelligence is gender neutral, and it is, he says, goes on to say that women from varied backgrounds possess extensive knowledge of Shastras and poetic genius. And he mentions many such names, and you know, we should thank Rajashekara for mentioning the names of very many female poets. We do not have any information about many of these poets, but we have the names. Avanti Sundari herself is credited with a practice dictionary. Her husband Rajashekara was a court poet and grammarian in the court of Mahendra Pala of Pala dynasty. And he describes, uh, Rajashekara describes her as a jewel of Chauhan family. So probably she was a Chauhan princess. And Rajashekara has frequently quoted her writings in his work. He definitely was not only a supportive uh, husband, he was, uh, uh, he was, he did not uh, mix words uh, uh, when he talked about the intelligence of women and women poets. And uh, he, he reiterated, he has reiterated in many places that how intelligence is gender neutral. Kema Chandra, a later poet, has also quoted Avanti Sundari's work in uh, stanzas of his book called Deshi Nama Mala to illustrate the meaning of certain craft uh, uh, expressions. Now, let us uh, go to go further back to 400 BC and 600 uh, CE. Now, this period is dominated with writers from uh, Tamil Nadu. So, apart from the scholar Queen Naganika, almost all the names I have all the names I have mentioned here are from Tamil Nadu, are from Sangam literature, which belongs to this period. This does not mean that the other parts of the country did not produce scholars. They, every region would have produced scholars. You know, I do not have, or I did not have much time to look into it. And uh, uh, regional literature uh, should be able to throw more information on scholars, women scholars, during this period. But uh, there are... Uh, uh, a lot of uh, information about Queen Naganika, who belonged, who lived during the second and the first century BC. We know it from the Nanegat uh, inscriptions, uh, from the Nanegat caves. Uh, so you can, she belonged to the Shatavahana Empire. She was a queen there. You can see in the map the extent of the location of the Shatavahana Empire. And you can see in the next map shown in the middle where these Nanegat caves are. And inside, Below you see the Nanegat inscriptions. 
So uh, Queen Nagarnika was the wife of Shatakarni of Shatavahana dynasty, which ruled India, parts of India between 221 BCE and 102 CE. She ruled the empire for nearly 56 years after the death of her husband. She was very scholarly and very deeply involved in the governance of her empire. She is considered a very good administrator and coins were minted in her name and the inscriptions in the Nanakat uh, caves are first hand account of the queen from the queen herself. Uh, another uh, scholar during this time uh, is Madhavi. And uh, she was a royal dancer. She was a scholar in dance and music. She was an expert in 11 types of dance. And she was also an expert in instruments like yaw, uh, uh, which is something like a harp, flute, and also drum. And the details about the scholarship are, is mentioned in Silapadigaram, uh, which was also written, uh, which is a Tamil, uh, uh, you know, uh, epic. It was written during the same period in the between 90 to 120 CE. And uh, Madhavi is mentioned as one who has contributed extensively to dance literature. Uh, Madhavi's daughter was Manimekalai. You can see in the picture, you know, of this lady, beautiful lady who is giving uh, arms to people. She was a very beautiful dancer, and uh, it is said that the Chola prince wanted to marry her. But she became a Buddhist monk and she was a great Buddhist scholar. So now let us go to the uh, Vedic period. This is before 400 uh, uh, BCE. And women scholars of ancient India were called Rishikas. So whereas many scholars were called Rishis, the women scholars had a separate, uh, uh, you know, uh, they were called by separate name called uh, Rishikas. And there were some very famous rishikas of Vedic tradition like Yami, Saraswati, Gargi, Maitreyi, Loka Mudra, Madarasa, and so on. And uh, this uh, list gives you the, uh, uh, you know, something, sorry, something I forgot to tell about uh, the Sangam poetess is that although I showed a number of, uh, 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 you know, names, there were, there are many more names which I have not listed there for want of space. Now, the same thing happens uh, here as well. There are mention of uh, many Rishikas and Brahmavadinis, uh, and I have mentioned only some of them here. And uh, so there are many more names uh, of uh, Rishikas, Brahmavadinis, and uh, philosophers. And it is uh, the seers of uh, Rigveda Shuktas. I, I have mentioned the numbers here, they are all women. And here, the numbers that you see in some, again, some of the names, it gives you the reference in the Rig Vedas, Suttas. So here, I'm going to talk about just two of them. And uh, probably all of you would have heard of the uh, name Varki. Uh, whenever one talks about the women scholars from India or how uh, women were educated in India, the name that springs up to everybody's mind is Varki. She was a Brahmavadini. She was a great scholar and philosopher. She was invited to attend the philosophers' conference uh, organized by King Janaka. There, she challenged the intellectual giant Yajnavalkya with courage and conviction. Her searching cross examination shows her to be a dialectician and a philosopher or a, of a very high order. So, the chapter 3 in Brahadaranya Upanishad. Uh, gives more details of her, and there are more details of this in Yajna Valkya Samhita as well. So she says, I rise to challenge you, Yajna Valkya, with two questions, much as a fierce warrior would rise to challenge an enemy. Give me the answer. She demands, she does not ask for an answer, she demands an answer from Yajna Valkya. With these daring words, Garki launched into philosophical debate with Yajna Valkya. Uh, the other very interesting uh, 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 scholar is Ubeha Bharati. She was a housewife. She was a householder. She was a wife of Mandana Mishra. She was a highly respected Brahmavadini. She was so respected, so highly respected for scholar for a scholarship that none other than Adi Shankaracharya requested her to be the adjudicator, to be the jury for the scholarly debate between him and her husband Mandana Mishra. The verdict of the debate was given by Ubaya Bharati. 
she judged shankar out to be the champion which had the unusual consequence of compelling her husband to submit to shankar's philosophical uh, school following this judgment she also had a debate with shankara because she felt that shankara lacked knowledge in certain aspects of life so these are some of the references uh, i have, have managed to squeeze in uh, in the in this slide i actually uh, referred the close to 50 or uh, uh, you know documents and you can see some of them here uh, so i thank you all uh, for uh, giving me this uh, wonderful opportunity uh, to talk on this because it has given me some time to uh, uh, dig into our literature and uh, let me again tell you all that i have dug very very shallow uh, we have lost much information but even with whatever information we have uh, you know there are uh, very many names that crop up and uh, you know all of these uh, stories are very very inspiring and uh, so thank you very much thank you very much ma'am for that uh, wonderful presentation um just a brief comment if we type in wikipedia for the names of indian women scholars it would not even carry a tenth of the names that you have showed us today in your presentation so that shows the kind of uh, bias that we also see it in the literature or in the media now i request uh, my colleague dr ashwini to moderate the question answer session from the audience thanks ram uh, the floor is now open for any questions please use the raise hand button so that we can uh, coordinate this exercise we have approximately 10 minutes a little more than that maybe yeah thank you satyavrata is having a question so please go ahead thank you um thank you very much ma'am for this very very nice talk um i have a, a general question more of a general question about the first couple of slides that you mentioned that you talked about different kinds of scholarship and you talked about acquired versus uh, innate and self taught and so on and over the years or, or over the centuries it seems that um we have more and more gravitated towards um scholarship that is associated with an institution um and more increasingly leaning towards peer acceptance and so on so in today's uh, and this is true even in the court, courts of the kings where other scholars had to come and uh, sort of show their scholarship and prove their excellence in front of other other scholars in the court uh, and today that would translate to being associated with an institution and publishing um but my question is in today's world if we had someone with uh, unconventional scholarship that you sort of alluded to at the beginning of the presentation have we completely lost that mode of scholarship in moving towards one kind of scholarship alone and if there are women like that today uh, would they have any opportunities at all uh, for the scholarship to blossom uh, thanks for asking this question um see uh we should also understand that not everybody who has a education institutional education or scholar all of us get degrees right but scholarship is beyond degree so not everybody who has a uh, institutional qualification can be called scholars and uh, yes you know there are i am sure that that all uh, uh, a lot of women and even men out there even now who are uh, who have native intelligence and then who do uh you know a scholarly work and uh, it is important to um to acknowledge them and because they can be uh, sources of great inspiration and they can also you know give uh, some kind of direction to the kind of education system we have you know how does the education system produce scholars in the true sense of the word so this we can uh, learn only from people who are unschooled scholars in fact you know there is an increasing trend uh, you know now for unschooled uh, scholars so there are you know uh, quite a number of uh, parents uh, 
who are uh, homeschooling their children. And uh, I personally know a couple of them as well, but of course these are few and far in between. This should be encouraged because the kind of scholars, uh, uh, you know, that our present education system uh, uh, produces, uh, well, I think, you know, uh, I won't say the less said better, but something along those lines is what I would like to comment. Thanks, Satya. Uh, Suganda? Good morning. Uh, thanks for a wonderful presentation that was not only informative but highly inspiring. So I have a couple of questions. One is a general thing. The women scientists have come a long way, but challenges do persist today also in some form or the other. So what is one message that you would like to give, one thing? And secondly, from your talk, the names that came up as has already been pointed out. Now these are not uh, very much familiar names. So in general also, it seems that women scientists are not as much celebrated. So uh, to give them kind of a celebrity feeling or to show them as examples to younger generation, what are the good, good things that we can really do? Well, not everybody is like the 10th century Rajshekra and the he poet Hemachandra. So I think things are... Uh, it looks as if, you know, things are uh, uh, much better in earlier days and, you know, women scholars were called for, uh, they were called for invited lectures, they were allowed to ask questions and their works were uh, uh, referenced. So this probably is something that we are seeing, uh, maybe, I may be wrong as well, that uh, we see more of it now. See, challenges will always be there. And it is good to have challenges because it brings out the best in you. And it uh, uh, it makes you uh, not only a better scholar uh, because it gets your mind ticking, and it makes you a better person as well because you know you realize it gives a chance for realizing your potential. This is how I look at challenges. So you know uh, a life without challenges may be very boring, and uh, women have women have a uh, inherent strength in them, and uh, it is. Uh, it is, it is not at all difficult for women to rise up to challenges. And uh, uh, so that is my my answer to your first question. And challenges will be there. Let us not forget that, uh, uh, it's, uh, that we, uh, don't, let us not think that men don't face challenges. Everybody face challenge uh, these days. And of course, the challenges that women face, uh, they know there is a slight difference in dimension as well. But nevertheless, challenges are common for everybody. And uh, the second one is, you know, where uh, the, the scientists are, uh, uh, the, the names of the scientists uh, that I showed on the slides is not known uh, even in the current time. It is very, very sad. And I think, uh, uh, especially when you read about Viva Chaudhary, as a physicist myself, uh, you know, it is, uh, it has made me very, very sad. She was, she worked in TIFR. And uh, even her male colleagues have been, uh, you know, kind of acknowledged uh, by uh, INSA and many in many other ways by the country. And she was, she did not, uh, uh, you know, she was not acknowledged. And uh, but she seemed happy during uh, doing her research work. This is again a very typical attitude of uh, women uh, uh, now that you know we are all uh, happy uh, doing our work and you know we do not network. Uh, like the men do and we do not, uh, very few uh, women probably, again I may be wrong in this statement, very few women maybe, you know, they uh, uh, go for, you know, uh, put out the papers for recognition, we wait to be uh, 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 spotted and if you are not spotted and recognized, many of us don't feel unhappy about it, we are just happy doing our work. So this is uh, a maybe a, a problem with women as well and I think this is a, a mental status that women have to uh, come out of because uh, unless women come out of this mindset, uh, you know, uh, we will not become uh, role models for uh, for other women, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the female uh, children. And uh, th th there is no need for us to wait for men to acknowledge us. And uh, it is it would be good if women themselves acknowledge their contemporaries and peers. 
Thank you, Ram Ray. Please go ahead. Thank you so much for your views, Ram. Um, thank you, Professor Jason. That was an amazing uh, um, presentation. Uh, I I had a question relating to uh, the uh, words you specifically used just now, which is networking. So, uh, is there any evidence in in the eras that you discussed about uh, of women scholars in? Uh, in India and uh, in, or in the Indian subcontinent, having also corresponded with women scholars in other uh, countries or other uh, regions across the world? Well, they may have, they may not have. We do not know. Uh, we do not have information. Uh, see, we should also understand that uh, we are also focused on modern education that uh, we have lost touch with our roots and you know we do not have uh, uh, many of us i do not know how many of us can read our mother tongue and how many of us uh, you know uh, can read sanskrit and tamil because if we want to get information about what happened in bygone days we need to know sanskrit and tamil because all the ancient literature is uh, in these languages of course you know there are a lot of uh, uh, you know, documents, uh, you know, literature available in different regions of the of the country. So unless we look into it, uh, we will not be able to make a categorical statement either way. Uh, the um, um, uh, uh, so if you look at uh, the Sangam uh, 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 literature and the mention of uh, the the writers in Sangam literature. Some of them have uh, traveled beyond uh, beyond uh, the shores of India. For example, uh, Mani Mekale, who was the Buddhist scholar, uh, she went to Sri Lanka and she is also said to have visited Thailand and uh, 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 Indonesia. And we know that Sangamitra, the daughter of uh, uh, the Buddhist scholar and daughter of King Ashoka, uh, went to. Uh, uh, Sri Lanka and other places to spread uh, the um, uh, Buddhism. So I think women would have traveled and we need to see so there are a lot of literature that we have lost over a period of time but we need not uh, feel sad about it. Uh, of course we should feel sad about it but you know there is no need, uh, uh, there is no point in crying over uh, spilled milk but there are still a lot of literature which are yet to be deciphered and yet to be manuscripts which are lying, you know, unopened. So we would have a lot of information, uh, you know, uh, still available, but uh, who has the time to look into it? This is the saddest part. And uh, there, are, uh, there would be information in travelers, uh, members and foreign literature as well. So, for example, uh, the mention of Leelavati, uh, who was uh, uh, the daughter of the uh, astronomer Bhaskaracharya. Uh, her name is mentioned in the Persian translation of uh, the work of uh, Akbar's minister Paisi. So his work was translated in Persian and in that Persian translation we have the mention of uh, 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 Leelavati. So we do not know where, uh, where all, uh, you know, we can, uh, what are all the sources that mention has been made of these women scholars. I am sure women had, I think women of those uh, times, you know, contrary to the conception, assumption we have, they were both, uh, you know, uh, 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 brave and, you know, they were, uh, they stepped out of their houses and stepped out of their, uh, uh, you know, uh, domain and uh, visited other places to teach. Uh, uh, to teach, uh, uh, you know, to other women uh, uh, students. For example, the Rishikas of the Vedic time, they had, they studied uh, the Veda, they had, uh, uh, they studied Veda, Veda in a formal way under Guru, and they studied under male Gurus, and they were, uh, they had the right to perform all Vedic rituals. They could open, they could have their own ashram, they could start their own Gurukul, and they, they could train the students. So I think even the ancient uh, University of Nalanda, uh, there are mention of a number of women scholars there as well. So I think uh, it was a more egalitarian society, at least from the kind of information I have gathered uh, I know for this talk. Uh, it seemed uh, the situation seemed to be slightly better in those days, contrary to our, uh, to the, uh, to our assumptions.
Pankaj, please go ahead, Pankaj. Um, uh, very good talk, Professor uh, Rama Jai Sundar, and thank you very much. Um, in fact, as it is evident from your talk that in India we had glorious past. Even in uh, BCE, we had uh, women saints, and uh, they all have contributed in, in all spheres of science and literature, including art. But today we see that we are talking about gender equality. What do you think? Where did uh, things went wrong? I think it was the uh, colonization because the concepts of, uh, if you look at the way women were treated uh, in Europe uh, in those days, uh, uh, you will see that there was a lot of gender uh, you know, e equalities. So I think this was a concept that uh, the, the Europeans brought in here and uh, all said and then we are all, uh, you know, uh, trained in the uh, Western school of thinking. And I think that's, uh, that's where this concept has rubbed off uh, on us and also the uh, uh, coupled with this, uh, you know, our uh, lack of uh, uh, knowledge or interest to study uh, uh, our past, I think it's a combination of that and probably our assumption that, you know, scholarship uh, that we know of uh, in the way that we know of uh, may not have existed in those days. So this is one of the assumptions that we have. I think a combination of this have set things on the wrong path. Yes, Tarakanta, we are now uh, running short of time. Uh, Tarakanta, please go ahead. Uh, Ma'am, uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, as a comment, uh, to identify, recognize, and bring them to mainstream. So by them, I mean the scholarship which is not uh, uh, institutionalized, self-taught scholars. Uh, sorry, your voice is breaking. Can somebody, yeah. anybody heard it clearly? Can you? Repeat the question. So maybe I should repeat again. So yeah. it is uh, about this uh, uh, scholarship, which is uh, not recognized by any institution, but uh, that is self-taught or by some other inherent ways. Yeah. So do we have a mechanism in place by the government today to identify, recognize, and bring them to mainstream? Uh, see, I think. Uh, See, if you look at the award of Padma Shri in the last two, three years, yeah. uh, see, Padma Shri have been given to people who have not had a formal education, right? Uh, uh, so, you know, uh, so there are, uh, it has been given to agriculture, it has been given to, uh, uh, you know, a kind of few women, unknown women, uh, you know, unschooled scholars. Uh, and so, you know, the, see, we should also realize that the government can only do so much. And it is up to us, uh, the society, to uh, recognize uh, uh, recognize these scholars. And then, you know, now with, in the age of uh, social media and net, you know, I mean, nothing stops anybody from uh, identifying anybody and then introducing, putting the name on the social media. So I think all of us have a duty uh, to, uh, uh, you know, uh, bring up the names of unschooled scholars if we come across them and uh, bring it, uh, take it to the notice of the government as well. Thank you, Professor Jay Sundar. Now I give it back to Ram to continue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ashwini. And once again, thank you very much, Professor Rama, for your um, spontaneous acceptance to our request to come and deliver this talk. I am sure we all would have got uh, ample information and ample food for thinking uh, for dwell into each of these names and know more about themselves so that in the coming days, at least, if not, we can match the glory of the past, if not doing better, at least we can match the uh, glory of the past. So with that, I once again express my heartfelt thank you, ma'am, for your uh, time and uh, having addressed to us. Uh, 
Nishad, you are not audible yet. Hello, good morning. Am I audible? Yeah, you are visible and audible. Please put the PowerPoint in the presentation mode. Yes, okay. Yeah. All to you, Nishad. Yes, uh, very good morning to everyone present here. Uh, as Ram said, I will be talking about the women scholars of pre-independence era in education, medicine and chemistry. Now when we hear this word independence, the first name which comes to our mind is Mahatma Gandhi ji and to quote him, be the teacher that you want to see in the world. Well what I am going to talk about now are the women scholars who have been the change makers in respective fields. In the field of education, Savitri Bhai Pule, in the field of chemistry, Kamala Sahoni, and in the field of medicine, Anandi Bhai Joshi. They were the VIPs. Now, when I say VIPs, you would think it is very important person. Wrong. I meant they are the people who had the vision and the intention to help others and the passion to pursue their dreams. So they were truly VIPs. Now moving on to the field of education, it is said by none other than Nelson Mandela that education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. And if the men or the women who are sitting in this meeting today are listening here, have gone to school, have attended a formal education, you should thank this person, Savitri Bai Pule, because she was the first female teacher of India. Now, I'm talking about the period which is about 100, 150 years prior to her independence. Now, she was actually a child bride, as was the custom in those days, uh, who was married at the tender age of nine to a boy who was only 13 years old. And if you heard saying that, you know, this probably would have resulted in atrocities against her being a child who's married and all that, you're wrong. And generally there is a notion, you know, people think that uh, for portraying feminism or when you talk about women's rights, you always have to portray the men as a villain. It is not so. In fact, uh, one point I put forward here is the entire session talk about the women scholars of this pre-independence era was conceived by, by Dr. Ram. So this shows that men have always been supportive of women. And in fact, when Savitri Bhai Pule got married to uh, Jodi Rao, uh, little did anyone in their families you know, knew that they are probably going to change the entire trajectory of India. In fact, there's a saying, right, for every uh, success of every man, there is always behind a woman. In this case, it was actually the man behind the success of a woman. He was a very forward thinker. 
he realized that education to women is the one which is actually going to change the world so he made his wife to get trained at a school and she came out with flying colors along with another woman during that time who was fatima sheikh and in fact she is credited as the first muslim woman of the uh, country who was the teacher and uh, in 19 uh, sorry in 1848 both the husband and wife established the first school for girls which was in vishrambagh wade pune and to start with only nine girls initially enrolled but of course the numbers rose to 25 and uh, while she became the headmistress she also taught alongside a fellow trainee fatima sheikh and uh, jodi rao's uh, emancipated aunt saguna bai now you might think okay uh, she was lucky to have a husband who was you know so supportive of her and when uh, she got educated obviously she wanted to pass on this to the uh, others you know to give back to the society so if you think, it was an easy journey for her to go okay i am educated now let, let me be a teacher for a few other girls it was not so she faced innumerable abuses and listened to obscenities heaped on her on the way to teach in fact to tell you a tale of two saris when we get to office what do we do we pack we get dressed up we pack cover laptop these days for sure and our cell phone and few papers and probably lunch to office right that's what we do but trust me in those days savitri bai packed two saris you know why because when she was walking down to school the people threw at her rotten eggs tomatoes cow dung and all kinds of filth to deter her from executing her joy or her duty which she felt she has to give back to the society by teaching girls so such were the times in which savitri bai did what she did and in fact she was recognized for her exemplary work by the british government itself and between this period of 1848 and 1852 the couple established no less than 18 schools for women now if you think okay savitri bai phule was the you know educationist who went ahead and you know started schools for girls no you were wrong because she was much much more than that she was truly a tradition breaker breaker what she did was she started you know uh, realizing that there are so many other social evils which the women were subjected to do during that period for instance you know uh, when uh, a woman young whether it's young or old uh, she becomes a widow there is a tradition that she has to shave off her head so this couple in fact they organized the first of its kind barber strike you know for castigating them for shaving the heads of young widows and in fact during those times you know there, there was more much of this caste system and all that where you know in, not everybody could uh, use the water from the same well and so on but this couple again they opened up their own water reservoir for everyone and they did a lot of work in feminine for men and also established 52 boarding schools for orphan children in fact so much so she even adopted a son uh, his name is eshwan Uh, from a lady who was actually you know wanting to die because she was raped and she got pregnant and you know she was uh, thrown out of her house from that person you know uh, the kid of that person she adopted and then she realized there are as you know so many evils which are faced by the women of those days and she established uh, different associ- organizations to address to these issues as well for instance the rape victims and the destitute women so it was a lot more you know the, holistically she was trying to address to all the issues of the women and in fact after even jodi rao phule died she continued to do exemplary work and she took over the satya sadhok samaj which was founded by him and in fact she was a multi faceted women as well she was not only the first women uh, teacher women educationalist or you might call the women uh, feminist she was also a poetess she wrote two poetries uh, kavya phule and bhavan kashi subodh ratnakar which continue to inspire us today also with a lot of questions on caste and gender women's emancipation has never been easy and perhaps would never be but savitri bai phule the mother of indian feminism achieved at that period what the fruits we are enjoying today now moving on to chemistry 
In fact, in the words of the Nobel laureate William Ramsey, the country which is in advance of the rest of the world in chemistry will also be foremost in wealth and in general prosperity. There are many uh, women students in IIC Bangalore, specifically, and, uh, and in fact, not only in master's level, even in the PhD level, right? Then there is one person you have to thank. If there is any audience in the present here who is from IIC Bangalore, especially women, you should thank her. Not because she's just the first Indian women PhD in science. In fact, uh, there's a debate. There's also this uh, Janaki Ammal, who's a botanist, a very famous botanist. Uh, but the difference is that uh, the degrees came from uh, abroad and from India. So that is why she is credited as the first Indian women PhD in a scientific discipline. In fact, uh, she uh, was born into a family uh, which was pretty highly educated. In fact, her father. Uh, went to IISC Bangalore. Her uncle also graduated from IISC Bangalore. So obviously, as a young uh, Kamala, she was like, you know, enthused and said, I want to be like my father, you know, get into IISC because even in those days, IISC was considered as one of the best places to study science. So when uh, she did her uh, BSc with chemistry as the majors and physics as uh, minor from the Bombay University, she came out with flying colors and she applied to IISC Bangalore to do her master's. Lo and behold, her, her uh, application was rejected and the reason cited was that she was a woman. And it was none other than Professor C. V. Raman, who was a then director of IISC, who said that. We all know what Professor C. V. Raman was and uh, uh, with all his uh, uh, intellectual mind, uh, probably to Towards women, he was not so kind, and uh, he she didn't give up, right? She she said no, just because if I'm a woman, I, I'm not admitted. It is not done. So she sat in dharna in front of his office, and you know pressurized him to admit. Nonetheless, he did uh, you know accept, but with three conditions. The first condition was that she will not be allowed as a regular candidate. She'll be put on probation for one year and depending on how she performs, she'll be allowed to continue. And she has to work late night as per the instructions of her guide. And she will not spoil the environment of the lab, meaning she will not attract on toward attention towards herself from other men students or men colleagues, which definitely, you know, uh, didn't go down well with her. She took it as uh, a challenge, in fact. She said, I'm going to disprove, you know, the notions of uh, this person. And due to her excellent performance, in fact, Raman had to give her permission to pursue further research. And IISC opened the doors for women scientists. A silent revolution had been fought and won. As I said, if today women enter into IISC Bangalore to do their masters or PhD, the credit goes to this lady who made the doors of IISC open for the women. And if you want to talk about her scientific contributions, in fact, as I said, uh, she was uh, working under uh, Sri Sivaya uh, in uh, IISC Bangalore and did exemplary work, which I said, uh, you know, made Ra Professor Raman to change his mind. She was invited to UK's Cambridge University to work under uh, Dr. Derek Richard uh, of the Frederick G. Hopkins Laboratory. He was a Nobel Prize winner as well. And in fact, uh, she did a very pioneering uh, discovery that, you know, every cell of a plant tissue contained the enzyme cytochrome C, which was involved in the oxidation of all plant cells. And generally, if there are any PhD scholars sitting here, uh, you always think, right, if I, if I publish a PhD thesis of 300 pages minimum or, you know, more, then the thesis uh, speaks volumes. It, it was not so in her case. She submitted her thesis in 14 months time and it was just 40 pages long. Okay, a typical departure from at least these days what the PhD scholars submit. So her research, in fact, dwelled in the effects of vitamins and into nutritive values of pulses, paddy, and group of food items specifically consumed by the uh, poor section of uh, the Indian population. And uh, to point out here, uh, the then president, uh, Rajendra Prasad, he asked her specifically to work on this uh, plant extract called Neera. 
in fact uh, this is some uh, a fruit supplement which is actually taken as a staple food by many uh, in india who are in uh, below poverty line so kamala found that uh, nira contains sizable amount of vitamins and iron that could be retained even if the drink was made into a jaggery to increase the shelf life and this discovery laid the groundwork for using jaggery and molasses as an affordable dietary supplement for malnutrition children and pregnant women uh, and uh, let me also tell you there is some uh, society which is called as consumer guidance society of india it's it's a, a very big society today and it was founded uh, you know uh, during this period of hers by nine women and she was a very very active member in this and she came to be the president elect also of this uh, association or organization and she has also authored several articles and uh, she died in 1998 uh in fact uh, uh, she just collapsed right after a felicitation uh, ceremony which was done by icmr in delhi so women scientists across the world have been fighting for gender bias for decades and kamala soni defied the gender bias moving on to the field of medicine whenever the art of medicine is loved there is also a love of humanity this is by hippocrates who is considered as the father of medicine anandi joshi is the first female indian physician uh, we did see in our uh, keynote speaker's talk about several other women who have been uh, you know uh, doctors or physicians but she is credited as the first female indian physician to have got a proper professional western education uh, degree on medicine so that is why she is considered as the in fact not only in india the first south asian female physician and the first indian female physician to be trained in the tradition of western medicine and uh, she is also the first woman to put her foot into the soil of uh, united states of america and first hindu uh, woman as well and here again i must mention that she was married at the tender age of nine so she was also a child bride and in fact she was married to a man who was 20 years older to her but again if you thought you know uh, men would you know try to suppress women and uh, especially the wives you know then you're wrong because uh, her, her husband as well encouraged her to give her best and uh, supported her in her dream and passion so she is the first licensed women doctor she was intelligent and industrious and these qualities were actually you know kind of got a lot of mockery uh, from the more conservative elements of the late 19th century of the indian society and uh, you know when she wanted to study this medicine actually uh, there was a mo- moment in her life which defined that you know she wants to study medicine uh, as i said she was married at the age of 9 uh, at age of 14 she delivered a child and the child died so it was that personal grief in fact many when you get a grief you like to you know give up and keep crying and sitting in a corner but no anandipai joshi decided to make sure that no other women go through this ordeal she said you know in the earlier uh, times uh, indian women were shy of Uh, you know going to a male doctor because you know uh, for you know the reasons so she's in fact in a letter which she wrote to us to say that you know i want to be you know given admission she said that i want to come back and work for my country the women who to, who rather prefer even dying than going to a male doctor so that was the um, what do you say the, the purpose which she decided when she faced the personal grief vishad vishad and yes can you wind up wind up yeah 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 i'm done in fact i just want to show this uh, letter uh, which she said before going to the uh, you know us when people said no you can't go uh, just two lines i would read you ask of me why i should do what is not done by any of my sex to this i can only say that the society has a right to our work as individuals so it is not to do with the whether you are a woman or a man and she was truly a ray of hope her last words were she died really young at the age of 22 because of tuberculosis her last words were i have done all that i could so she was truly a trailblazer and uh, as uh, our keynote speaker was also mentioning there are so many women scholars 
so many of them that you know it will take a lot of time in fact i'm also running short of time here to you know list them all what i've done here is given only the three of them the first female teacher the first uh, person to get the phd in science and the first women physician but there is a lovely book which has been brought out by this indian academy of sciences which was published in 2008 leelavati's daughters it sketches about uh, you know the all the uh, women both in pre independence and uh, post independence era and i'm very happy to tell you here that uh, one of them who features in this leelavati's daughter was my own mentor dr aruna dattatriyan and uh, she continues to inspire me till date and just to tell you you know a brief anecdote this morning this very morning she sends me one uh, link uh, you know where uh, young women can apply for a particular uh, you know position so and she said you please share it with uh, you know whoever you know it will fit into this age group so that is the kind of you know enthusiasm and i truly think she's my role model and because of her i have you know taken it up on myself to make sure that i contribute to the society So, what is the take-home message? I would just play this video, which is just thirty seconds. Uh, Nisha, I don't think we can hear the video. Oh, we cannot. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think the. Yes. Never ever give up on your dreams. If you want something, go get it. Period. That's the message here. So I'm just finishing with a nice couplet, you know. Khudi ko kar buland itna ki har takdeer se pehle khuda bande se khud puche pata tere raza kya hai. So be the change. want to see in this ball and in a gentle way you can shake this ball and if not now when do it now and i dedicate this talk to all the indian women scholars especially the women in inyas the vinyas this picture is photo courtesy of dr chandra the chair inyas on our uh, international women's day uh, but i would also like to say that there are a lot of empty frames here so i would wish all of us contribute to bring in more people into those empty frames for glory thank you all for your patient listening thank you thank you nishad maine apne aap ko itna buland kar diya ki ek gustakhi bhi kar dala ki aapko samay se pehle jaane ko kaha anyway thank you for that wonderful presentation nishad uh maine no request thank you nishad the audience may note that we have changed the order of the sequence because nishad has Uh, i'm really glad that nishad could take her time off on this auspicious day of eid where she had a lot of uh, commitments uh, despite that she has taken her time for this uh, presentation so thank you nishad for that thank you as well for the support <laughs> that's good so that's why we had to change the order because she has to uh, attend to her other commitments now i request uh, the next speaker dr ashwini from iisc bangalore to share with us his thoughts on women scholars in mathematics and physics ashwini thank you ram i will be talking about women scholars in mathematics and physics uh, so um the first thing i want to say is that this i was pressed with time because we i have only 15 minutes so when i was looking into mathematicians and physicists um it be, it became little difficult but the person i had chosen to speak on physics uh professor rama jay sundar already spoke about her the legendary uh, biba choudhary so that helps me so i'll be focusing in the interest of time on women mathematicians now if we see the modern era we'll see that there are a lot of names in uh, uh, of women math mathematicians which are very well very well known worldwide just to name a few nina gupta uh, one of the youngest uh, bhatnagar awardees for her work in algebraic geometry renuka ravindran It's work in non-linear waves and uh, non-Newtonian uh, fluids, and the other three names from uh, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, one of the powerhouses of modern Indian mathematics. Now, the area that I have specifically focused on uh, the time 
uh, that I have the time period that I have specifically focused on is women mathematicians in colonial era. So I am looking at the uh, early 20th century. This was a very interesting period of time, and uh, for example, Biba. Chaudhary also grew up in this phase. So we are looking at this last phase of colonial era, but interestingly, by this time, the modern education had already taken roots in India. However, the opportunities for higher education research uh, were limited. And women faced other challenges, which my colleagues have already spoken about, in pursuing a career in scientific research. So prominent women math mathematicians from this era, among others, include uh, Padmavali for her work on theory of numbers and integral function, and Pankajam for her work on Boolean algebra. But the I am um, going to focus on this incredible personality, Dr. T. A. Saraswati Amma and her colossal work on the geometry and the history of geometry in India. So before I get into details, I would like to tell you a little about her early life and then get uh, then share more details about her work. So she was born in 1918 as second daughter to her parents in Palakkar district of Kerala. Um, her siblings, she had two brothers and two sisters, the family traditions in learning and arts. Uh, her younger sister, Raja Lakshmi, was actually a very famous uh, story writer in Malayalam, and the family had that kind of culture. Uh, moving on, she did her um, BA from Madras University uh, with uh, subjects in physics, mathematics, and Sanskrit. Then went on to do MA in Sanskrit from BHU and finally MA in English Literature from Bihar University. So this was all this was in uh, early 40s. Now the onset of this extraordinary journey starts uh, after approximately a 10 years break she takes and she, um, she was a teacher in Kerala and then she again approaches Madras University for a PhD. And her interactions with the very well-known uh, Dr. V. Raghavan, the expert on Indology and Sanskrit, were the beginning of this story. Now, um, Dr. Raghavan was aware that Saraswati had rigorous background in mathematics, physics, Sanskrit, and English. Her native language was Malayalam. That is, we'll, we'll appreciate that in a while, why that is important. So he was of the opinion that as against the conventional topics or prevalent topics of that period around 40s and 50s that is Alamkara literature or Vedanta studies he wanted her to take up Indian contribution to mathematics. I would also like to say that 1940s and 50s was a time in Madras University when there was um, there was considerable amount of work going on following the uh, commentary on Kerala School of Astronomy and Mathematics. So there was an environment already there and the prominent names were uh, Dr. C. T. Rajagopal who was already working on uh, the Indian contributions to mathematics by 40s. So having this kind of motivation, now the next thing to note is that there, 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 were, there was literature which was already dealing on the subject. For example, the famous two volume books on history of Hindu mathematics which came out in 1935 and 38 dealing with arithmetic and algebra. Now Saraswati knew very well that uh, there is a huge void here. We do not have anything on geometry here and it is a very common understanding that lot of results in arithmetic and algebra that the Indian mathematicians produced were either rooted in geometry or had very strong interpretations using geometry. So that was then decided as her PhD area but now let us look at the landscape, the enormous challenge that she took upon. If we look at the landscape, we'll see that the Indian mathematics, uh, the medieval and the ancient, can be summed up uh, in the following fashion. We have the Vedic period all the way up to Shulva Sutras, up to 200 BC. Then with the advent of Jainism and Buddhism, we have a lot of prominent contributions from Jain mathematicians. Up to 200 AD, the uh, incredible story of Bakshali a manuscript, which was discovered uh, near a village uh, near Peshawar, which is in Pakistan currently. And then we, we see the starting of the classical period with some very big names in Indian mathematics, Aryabhatta and Brahmagupta, and continuing again with the Jain mathematicians, Virasena uh, Mahavira Acharya and Sripati, and of course Bhaskara II. Finally, we have this intense and incredible mathematical developments at the Kerala School of Astronomy and Mathematics uh, by Madhava Parameshwara and Jeshtadeva of the the later commentaries in Malayalam language. 
Now, just to give you a glimpse of the challenge, um, a little more on the details, the ancient mathematical tradition was to put results in a very succinct manner. We all know that these details and proofs were essentially uh, accompanied as oral discussion, so they were not to be found. And these were typically works of renowned masters, and the subject was aimed at the intelligent student. For example, I can quote Apashtamba's rule from Shulba Sutra, that is Samasya Dvikarani, which would express only that the diagonal makes it double. But we all know that this is not the length. So this is essentially the area of the square that you will create on the diagonal of a square that would be double. So these were very, very succinct uh, rules. And then to understand, comprehend, and put it forward in terms of proofs and scientific communication to the modern world to reestablish a lot of these things was indeed a huge challenge. So, um, just to give you what was the outcome of this, before I uh, get into some of the details, she did submit her thesis after approximately three years of work. In 1963, she had troubles publishing it, in fact, a lot of trouble, and it took a lot of time and proofreads and corrections that finally the book came out, the very, very famous geometry in ancient and medieval India. In 1979, the book has 10 chapters, starting chronologically with Shulba Sutras and Jain contributions, and then treating the subject-wise trapezium, quadrilateral, triangle, circle, volume surfaces, geometrical algebra, and some problems on shadow. This was again discussed in the chronological order. So what I'm going to do now in the next four to five minutes is just take you through this incredible journey only for a very, very short period of time, that is the Shulba Sutras, the Vedic period. So what are Shulba Sutras? Shulba Sutras are essentially chord rules or chord manuals for constructing Vedic rites for uh, the the fire altars for Vedic rites which are Nitya, Perpetual or Kamya, optional. And this these were built for religious purposes and the, one of the most famous ones you see on your screen is Shena Chita which, which is of the form of golden eagle or falcon because this rite is for those who desire to reach heaven. So this is the most magnificent flight. So if you want to uh, create or have this right, then you have to create a altar which is of this shape. And in this shape itself, you can readily see squares, rectangles, trapezia, and right angle triangles. But this may appear to be very simple, but in fact, this was very, very accurately built. And what you see in your screen is a method described in Shulba Sutra to how to construct a square. So when you have two intersecting circles and the common chord, this is perpendicular to the line joining the centers of the circle. This is the bottom line, the basic by which the um, uh, uh, Shulba Shutra era people constructed the bisector of a line and using that and few other circular constructions, they could uh, make a square. Now I'll get into the cornerstone of Shulba Sutra geometry, which is very well known as square on the diagonal and a very detailed work by Dr. Saraswati on this subject. So, just to tell you, by 800 BC, the Vedic priests were very well versed with what was later recognized as Pythagoras theorem. For example, there is a Shulba Sutra which says, Dirgasya Kshaniya Raju Parshumani Tiryamani Cha Yat Pratak Bhute Kurutast Duhem Karoti. The diagonal chord of rectangle makes both squares that the vertical side and the horizontal side make separately. So, this is, in most categorical words, the enunciation of the Pythagoras theorem. And then uh, the other Shulba Sutra that I would like to read is uh, Chatur, Chatur Treya Kshanya Raju Raju Dirvas Vistavatim Bhumi Karoti. The diagonal chord of a square makes double the area. Now, this is a very a fascinating result because you can see in this uh, square that if you construct another square on the diagonal, then that square will have an area which is double this square. That can be readily understood by the fact that if you have two uh, right angle triangles here in this square, the one that you construct on the diagonal will have four of them. And that is one interpretation of this result. However, this result itself has far reaching consequences on the geometry. And one of the things that uh, uh, the uh, Vedic people were interested in knowing that the length of the diagonal, you can see that it cannot be expressed uh, in a simple relationship with the other, for example, the base here. So this was, they could then investigate this issue and come up with uh, the value of root two, which is given here, and I'm quoting this from Shulba Sutras as discussed by Dr. Saraswati, and this is accurate up to five decimal places. So you're looking at 800 BC, 500 BC, and 
the accuracy of these mathematicians was phenomenal and this was also there is a comment that although we have this number this is still approximate so they had the appreciation of the rational number square root being one of them and the other very famous one is the uh, the pi the relationship between the circumference and diameter of a circle so moving on there are the shulbha sutras as discussed in detail by dr saraswati in the second chapter of her book deal with a lot of geometrical constructions and their conversions for example on your screen you can see here if you want to construct a rectangle of the same area of that of a square all you need to do is to cut the square on the rectangle and then consider these two uh, triangles formed by the other diagonal and then just rotate flip them and place them along these two edges you will have a rectangle of the same area as that of the square of course the lengths of the rectangle are, are um, we do not have much, much control on that but there are other very detailed constructions to have uh, that flexibility as well so this is another use of the square on the diagonal principle here and then as i said there are numerous other constructions which would take uh, pages of proofs to discuss here for example the trapezium to rectangle and vice versa moving on there is another Uh, result that i specifically wanted to discuss with you to just to let you know the level of the understanding uh, of shulbha sutra priests now if you look at katyayana's combining of large number of squares you can look at this problem on the right side there is a square which is of side a and okay um you want to construct another square which is n times the area of that so the uh, katyayana's logic says that you should construct an construct an isosceles triangle with the base n minus 1 times a and the hypotenuse n plus a by 2 and just by using the uh, right angle triangle here abd you can find out that ad would eventually turn out to be a root n and hence if you construct a square here the light orange color this would now be n times the area of the original square there are few other uh, constructions here which i would skip uh, be uh, because of short of time Uh, if um, square on the diagonal was the cornerstone of shulbha sutra geometry the classical period as uh, dr saraswati discusses in great detail the cyclic quadrilateral a uh, couple of very important results by brahmagupta in this period for example the area that you have here of the uh, cyclic quadrilateral in relation to the perimeter now it is very interesting that all of us know that a quadrilateral will require five elements for it uniquely defining it and there were only four here so there when uh, brahmagupta brahmagupta proposed these results there was a lot of debate and this continued continued on for centuries and in fact aryabhata has famously quoted that a mathematician who wants to compute the area of quadrilateral using only its sides is either a fool or devil so there were a lot of very interesting um, you know interaction between these two personalities and that confusion was because brahma gupta never clarified that this was actually uh, only applicable to cyclic quadrilateral this was later resolved by more works by kerala school of mathematicians and there are lot of very very important results um, uh, discussed therein and by now thanks to dr saraswati's work if you google this up you have brahma gupta's quadrilateral and there are lot of theorems and rules that are attributed to him so now i'll get into few more details of uh, the contributions of dr saraswati's geometry in ancient and medieval india so it's now finished. we know that ha huh. it's uh, how much more slides you have i can finish it in 4 to 5 minutes yeah please okay thank you the vedic indians had mastered the mathematics of perimeter area sides and wide variety of fundamental geometric shapes their conversion addition and subtraction square on the diagonal and full mathematical development common called which we saw the intersecting circles for the perpendicular by bisector so in the process what was firmly established was the indian contribution predating euclidean geometry by centuries uh, moving on i have already uh, talked about cyclic quadrilateral and it is widely recognized now by uh, modern mathematicians that the credit goes to the indian mathematicians one part of course uh, because of lack of time i could not discuss is madhava's work Uh, in the kerala school of astronomy and uh, mathematics particularly on the infinite series of pi expansion of sine and cosine functions he is now considered as the greatest medieval 
mathematician by all sources and lot of these series are currently being renamed as madhava newton series or madhava gregory series so lot of credit that all these indian math mathematicians have got is because of this contribution by dr saraswati um the there are also uh, parallels to the calculus in the proofs that madhava has given for volume of sphere and again the debate is very much on <laughs> whether the indian mathematic mathematicians knew about uh, the foundations of calculus 2 to 300 years before the newton leibniz theory and professor p p divakaran notes her prophetic prophetic work as the boat by which to navigate the ocean of knowledge that is our mathematical history after life i will not go into details because of short of time she did uh, she uh, did return to kerala after a uh, short stint at um, dhanbad as a college teacher and she could not pursue a lot of research afterwards because of uh, her mother's health and she herself had health issues and she was very happy to notice that lot of other students have taken up research in this area and the second edition of the book also came by she had she was suffering from cancer and passed away on august uh, on 15th august 2000 in her, in her honor kerala mathematics association organizes its annual conference a uh, professor t a saraswati amma memorial lecture these are some of the references that i have followed and special thanks to professor shri krishna dani of uh, uh, tifr mumbai for helping me with some of the references which i did not have and just before we part i want to say that the shena chita that is discussed by dr saraswati in great detail you can still see it in aritram atiratram ceremony in kerala and it also happens to be the logo of a uh, national institute of advanced studies uh, the next speaker is from that institute so this is a very happy coincidence thank you very much for your attention thank you very much ashwini for that wonderful presentation um next as already told by ashwini our speaker is from national institute of advanced studies dr m rajini she is going to speak to us on women scholars from Uh, literature and music over to you rajini thank you uh, i hope you can see me and also see my slides please confirm yes indeed uh, you can go on full screen mode on the presentation yeah. yeah is it now yeah perfect go ahead thank you very much ram and thank you very much ashwini uh, yes it is indeed a, a proud feeling for nia sites that we have such a prominent logo um i uh, thank ram for putting together this uh, uh, panel uh, i am not an expert in what i'm going to speak but i can only say that i learned learned a lot trying to prepare for this thing so i um, i have chosen five icons to speak about today uh starting from the sangam age and then one in two in medieval and two in the turn of 19th to 20th centuries sangam age was a period of history covering regions of the present day tamil nadu kerala and parts of sri lanka spanning from around 6th bc to 3rd ce dates continue to be debated it was named after the famous sangam academies of poets and scholars centered in the city of madurai there were nearly 30 poetesses of sangam period so that makes about 6.6% when we consider total number of contributors to be around at enias we are better than that in the gender ratio but in many other areas we are probably still after one and a half millennia equal or worse the name avayar literally means respectable woman and was attributed to various scholars at different times i'm going to speak about two of them avayar 1 the first one tops the list of 30 poetesses of sangam period in her intelligence creativity and fame out of over 2000 poems belonging to this classical age Avayar has authored 59. A large fraction of her poems were about bravery and governance, hence subjects were kings or chieftains of the time. She once saw the kings of the three contemporary dynasties that ruled much of South India, Chola, Chera and Pandya together and sang wishing them to be united forever. A chieftain named Adiyaman is a subject of many of her poems who also had great respect for her intelligence. and one sent her as an ambassador to his enemy sundaiman the latter received her and showed her his archery 
where his fresh looking weapons were decorated and exhibited. She cleverly and subtly conveyed to Tondeman, your weapons are unused, hence they look fresh, whereas Adiyaman's weapons were used and often go to repair. This led Tondeman to realize he is weaker than his rival and hence the impending war between the two had, was averted. So there were many such stories of uh, uh, wisdom and prowess of uh, the uh, uh, Avayar of uh, Sangam period. Another famous poet is also known as Avayar lived in the Chola period, 10th century. She is often imagined as an old and intelligent lady. She has authored many poems. One of her very lasting contribution has been the Aati Chuti, a collection of single line crisp and tight, known for their brevity phrases that are alphabetically organized. There are one or nine of these inspiring lines. These include insightful quotes expressed in simple words. It aims to inculcate good habits, discipline, and doing good deeds. For instance, First, alpha, uh, first letter, A. Uh, Aram Cheya Virumbu. Intend to do right deeds. A. Uh, Arvada Sinam. Control anger. E. Ielvattu Karavel. Help others as much as you can. E. Ivattu Vilakkel. Do not stop or avoid charitable deeds. Let me jump a few. A. Enelattu Ikalel. Do not despise numbers letters. In other words, maths, arts, science, literature and so on. There are, uh, these are even to today used while teaching Tamil alphabet in school. Her lines have inspired thinkers much beyond the realm of literature and music. For instance, the line, Katradu kaiman nalavu, kalladadu ulagalavu, has been translated as what you have learned is a mere handful. What you haven't learned is the size of the world. It's cited in NASA's webpage about universe. My next item is Akka Mahadevi who lived in 12th century. She was one of the early female poets of Kannada literature and a prominent person in the Lingayat Bhakti tradition. Her 430 extant poems called Vachanas, which are a form of spontaneous mystical poems, and two short writings are considered her most notable contribution to Kannada literature. The term Akka is an honorific given to her by contemporary Lingayat saints such as Basava and others. It literally means elder sister, which is an indication of her high place in spiritual discussions held at the Anubhava Mandava, a center of knowledge in what is now Basava Kalyan in the district of Karnataka. Little is known about her life, though it has been the subject of hagiographic, folk and myth mythological themes. Based on oral tradition and her own lyrics, the latter include a reference to one of her poems in which she lays down three conditions for marrying a king, including control over the choice to spend her time in the ocean or in conversation with other scholars and religious figures rather than with the king. Some sources say that when King Kaushika violated the conditions she had laid down, Akka Mahadevi left the palace, renouncing all her position to travel to Shalem, the home of God Parashiva. Alternative accounts suggest that her act of renunciation was a response to the king's threat after she refused his proposal. At present, her vachanas are sung by musicians, both in the classical Carnatic and Hindustani style, and also folk style. Here is one of them. Purushana munde maye striyamba abhimana vagi kaduvadu. Striya munde maye purushanemba abhimana vagi kaduvadu. Doka vemba maye ke sharana charitriya maralagi toru. Chenna Mallika Junna Nolida Sharanange Maya Yelli Marahilli Abhimanavu Sorry Maya Illa Marahilla Abhimanavu Illa Maya haunts the ego of a man in the form of a woman. Maya haunts the ego of a woman in the form of a man. To the world of Maya, a Sharanas, that is a devotee's madness, seems like Maya. To the world, sorry. For Sharana, who has love of Chenna Mallika Junna, there is no Maya, no madness, and no ego. The next caller uh, is Gauhar Jan. She lived in the turn of 19th and 20th century. She was an Indian singer and dancer from Kolkata. She was one of the first performers to record music on 78 RPM records in India. Gauhar Jan was born as Angelina Yawar of Armenian descent in Azamgarh. Her father was William Robert Yawar and mother Victoria Hemming. Victoria 
an Indian by birth, had been trained in music and dance. When Angelina was six, her parents separated, causing hardships to both mother and daughter. Later, in 1881, migrated with the who appreciated the mother's music. Later, mother converted to Islam and changed Angelisa, Angelina's name to Gauhar Jan and hers to Malka Jan. Over time, Malka Jan became an accomplished singer, Khatak dancer, and a courtesan in Banaras. Malka Jan moved back to Calcutta in 1883 and established herself in the court of Nawab Wajid Ali Shah. It is here that young Gauhar Jan started <clears throat> uh, training. She learned pure and light classical Hindustani vocal music, Kathak, Dhrupad Damar, and Bengali Kirtan, all from the best of teachers of the time. Soon she also started writing, composing ghazals under the pen name Hamdam and became proficient in Rabindra Shangi. Gohar Jan gave her maiden performance at the Royal Courts of Darbanga Raj in 1887 and was appointed as court musician after receiving extensive dance and music training from a professional dancer at Banaras. She started performing in Calcutta in 1896 and was called the first dancing girl in her records. So her Jan first visited Madras in 1910 for a concert and soon Hindustani and Urdu songs were published in Tamil music. In December 1911, she was famously invited to perform at the coronation of King George V at Delhi Darbar. She moved to Mysore in 18, 1928 at the invitation of Krishna Rajabari of the Pope, where she was appointed as palace musician, though she died within 18 months in Mysore. India's first recording session included Gauhar Jan, recorded by Fred Gaisberg of the Gramophone Company. The records were manufactured in Germany and shipped to India in April 1903. They proved great success in popularizing the gramophone in India. By 1903, her records started appearing in Indian markets and were in great demand. She recorded more than 600 songs from 1902 to 1920 in more than 10 languages, including Bengali, Hindustani, Gujarati, Tamil, Marathi, Arabic, Persian, Pashto, French, and English. She would round off her performances for a record by announcing my name is Gohar Jan. My last of uh, the scholars I would speak about, who has already been spoken about before uh, by um, uh, Professor Rama, um, is Bengaluru Nagaratnamma. She was an Indian classical singer, cultural activist, scholar, and courtesan. A descendant of courtesans, she was also a patron of arts and history. Nagaratnamma built a temple over the samadhi of the Panatic composer Tyagaraja Tirvayar and helped establish the Tyagaraja Aradhana festival in his memory. Within a male-dominated festival, she was the feminist aggressive enough to ensure that women artists were given equality to participate. She was among the last practitioners of the Devadasi, the Devadasi tradition in India and the first president of the Association of Devadasi so Madras Presidents. She also edited and published books in poetry and anthologies. Just last year, sorry, just last year, a very well put together musical drama on her life, directed by T. S. Nagavarana and produced by P. Rama, was made. I um, uh, glimpses of which I'm using here in this uh, talk with the permission of the director and the producer. Nagaratnama was born in 1878 in Nanjangud near Mysore. She became a singer early in life and emerged as one of the best Carnatic singers of her time. Sang in Kannada, Sanskrit and Telugu. Her spe special music forte included Harikatha, the traditional Karnataka prose poetry recitation. Her talent in dance attracted the attention of Mysore ruler, Vodayar, who made her Asthana Vidushi, court dancer <clears throat> in Mysore. Following the death of her patron, she moved to Bangalore. She was also patronized by many other royal houses, such as those of Travancore, Bobili, and Vijayanagar. Later, she moved to Madras, now Chennai, the mecca of Carnatic music, and there her musical talent further flourished. She was there. She, it was there she specially identified herself as Bangalore Nagaratna. She became an independent artist of her own right, and of course attracted jealousy from the male-dominated music community. I must also say she also had male uh, patrons who helped her, uh, but she also had problems among them. 
or uh, counterpart. Um, counterpart. Um, one such differences led to some accompanying male artists not only boycotting from her performance, from performing with her, but threatened all other male artists to do so. This Rajini, led her to. Rajini, work. Yes. Uh, you have exceeded your time. Okay, sorry. Okay, I'll um, I'll uh, point up. So Nagaratnama was um, uh, guided by her dream uh, of um, uh, setting up uh, this tradition of annual uh, festival at um, uh, Tiruvayar, uh, and so she went ahead and uh, set up this uh, festival, which is even to today celebrated. And for a lot of musicians of Carnatic music, it is uh, they congregate here annually. Or, uh, this I just want to um, uh, mention that um, um, as a promoter of Tyagaraj Aradna, she was the first female artist to play, pay income tax in her in Madras. There is a memorial sculpture of Navratnama at Tiruvayaru where she spent last years. What the play very poignantly captures at the end is a stark discrimination against the people. She started this institution. But even to today, her idol is masked with a screen, symbolically stopping her from participating. It has become a part of the ritual. The producer of this play told me it is her mission to raise awareness through this play about the unfortunate ritual and hopefully someday will become wise enough to stop it. I thank all of you for your patience. Thank you, Ram. Thank you very much, Rajini. And, uh that brings us to the close of uh, the three talks. Now, I, the floor is open for questions to uh, all these three speakers. And uh, if there are questions from our members, I request them to shoot them out. You can raise your hand and that will help me to see who is having the question. Dr. Ramanathan said, said this Dr. Rama here. I just yeah. want to make a small comment. Is that okay? Sure, ma'am. Please make. So, this is uh, a small clarification regarding Dr. Anandi Joshi. Uh, so, she was the first woman to uh, go abroad to get a degree in medicine, but she did not practice because she, unfortunately, she died very young. She died when she was 21. Dr. Rukmabai was the first one to practice. So that's what I had mentioned and I thought I'd just give this small clarification. And Dr. Kadambini Ganguly was the first woman uh, to uh, get a formal uh, degree in Western medicine in India. So there are subtle differences between the three people. So thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for that clarification. I was about to uh, raise that uh, query from my side as well, because the, the literature seems to be slightly confusing in that aspect. So, uh, do we have any... Um, I think Rajini's screen is still... Yeah, being shared. Yeah. Sorry, thank you. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Okay, so... I'm still looking for somebody to ask any question or any yeah, comment or make the discussion forward. Yeah, Sukandha, please go ahead. So my question is to uh, Dr. Ashwini. So uh, he presented a lot of facts about uh, history of mathematics, how uh, India has, you know, evolved and how great ideas people had. So whenever I conduct outreach lectures, I try to give some glimpse of these things to the kids also to kind of, uh, you know, create curiosity amongst them. Uh, but one question that often comes up is, uh, ma'am, okay, you told us about one thing. How do we in general, you know, uh, kind of get to know these things? How do we reach to these things okay. in general? So, okay. so can you give some better suggestion? Okay good reference okay uh, all right uh, first of all i would like to say that this book that uh, dr saraswati brought out the geometry in ancient and medieval india this uh, it's been say about 50 years or so 
and this this is a work which is now an authority on the subject it has brought so much change that in 50s very few people outside india knew about madhava's work and today he is by all you know accounts accepted as the greatest mathematician of medieval india so if you just look at dr saraswati's book that itself is an incredible source of information the details the length at which she treads through all these different regions uh, of ta- different uh, you know uh, time regions and then constructs the proofs and gives them in the chronological order is just incredible so i would certainly suggest all of us all of you to read the book it and it anybody can read that with a basic understanding of maths and this is a fascinating journey that you will have so if you read the second chapter in that book this which this is on shulba sutras and all these constructions and proofs which for example i had worked out some of them myself will are very easy to follow and it's an amazing uh, journey and all you need is uh, some strings and some pegs so some schools i know that uh, in fact in america as well they are now looking into shulba sutra geometry as you know tools or uh, courses for school children and uh, professor radham narsimha in his very famous uh, take on any uh, nias logo uh, has actually said that it's probably time that we should also teach our children how to draw these geometric figures using these strings and pegs so this book would be a very very good start for anyone to get into the ancient uh, indian mathematics and in fact the book covers a lot more that, than what i could cover in this brief time there are fascinating stories about madhava's contribution to calculus and brahmagupta uh, brahmagupta's quadrilateral is now these things are now very well known and the credit is given to these people who did that so this with great authority this work has established uh, those kind of things so when you take up the book and then there are other sources but the book itself is a great help to start Thank you. If I may add Ashwini to uh, Sugandha's question. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, one of our founding members of Inias, who in fact uh, retired from Inias this year, Dr. Venkateshwar Pai, he actually is an expert on. He is a student of uh, uh, Professor Ramasubramaniam of IIT Bombay. He was a founding Inias member. Uh, he is an expert in history of Indian mathematics. So, if Sugandha is interested, uh, she should actually contact. Dr. Pai also. Yeah, thank you, Ram. Uh, may I ask a question? My name is Deepa. I see, yes, see somebody uh, having raising the hand. I don't see the name. So sorry, my them, yeah, Sri Parna. After you, after Sri Parna, we'll go for Deepa. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Professor Ram. Actually, uh, the all the talks were uh, like uh, very interesting. So um, I just uh, I just would like to uh, comment one thing uh, that uh, one information actually I want to share that although uh, Dr. Bibha Chaudhary uh, suffered a lot and uh, probably she was not given uh, due credit, but uh, of late actually uh, I just uh, few uh, I think a few months back I, I came to know. Uh, that now we have one star uh, named after her and it is called Viva star and uh, it is like uh, maybe uh, it's massive even uh, than our uh, sun so i just wanted to share this information with uh, like uh, all of us so we have a star uh, uh, in the name of uh, dr Viva choudhury Yeah, Deepa. Thank you, Sri Parna, for that comment. Uh, we may have a question from Deepa. Yeah. Hi. Thank you. Uh, sorry, my raising hand button is not working. Um, so I had a question for Professor Rama and uh, the other speakers as well. Um, I feel like all of these uh, very interesting examples of women who were uh, at the forefront of their respective subjects and fields and had really important contributions are exceptional. Uh, examples perhaps for the time and era for which uh, which they represent i was wondering if as you read about these these women did you come across any patterns in terms of what kinds of things allowed these women to be to have the exceptional role or the impact that they that they did 
uh, in their society and and of course i mean they were you know remarkable women to begin with but what were the surrounding conditions that allowed them to flourish and and encouraged them to flourish and is that something uh, which can be translated and useful for our society now at this point i mean are you particularly referring to any presenter or you have left it open for any of us to answer it well like i guess i felt like professor rama had yeah. done a, a longer presentation and has read a lot about this but if anybody else has also uh, i mean yeah any any of them is fine so i can quickly answer this this is uh, professor rama here so i think uh, uh, that are uh, that would be different reasons uh, for the example shown in the different eras uh, if you look at the uh, pre colonizing that period or even even prior to that it looks as if uh, uh, you know the society was uh, set up in such a way that uh, women were encouraged and there were no taboos that way there would always be uh, women who would have faced problems but these people who were exceptional and who excelled in what they did it looks as if they did not face any problem if you go through their life histories where and then you know if you look at uh, the 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 period of colonization and the way the women have excelled what struck me was that almost all of them were supported by their fathers and husbands and some even by like in the case of dr rukma bai it was her step father who uh, supported her so the men seems to have uh, uh, risen up to the occasion and then you know they were the ones who were pulling their daughters or wives you know inside the system so i think the reason seem to be uh, uh, pretty different in the two eras thank you ma'am um are there any further questions ram can i yeah. add something sure yes. so these are just my two cents because i uh, followed uh, dr saraswati's work and her also other attributes very closely that the family environment um, is obviously was one of the factors because in her home her younger sister was into literature and this was a family which had long uh, rooted traditions in learning and arts so i do believe that the environment at home the the formative years that plays a vital role in uh, yeah people excelling later thank you ram can i also add yeah 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 please go ahead please yeah. go ahead so uh, i agree with the both have uh, said and to continue with what ashwini said about formative years uh, and the environment provided Uh, in addition to that beyond that uh, finding good mentors in some cases it could be a father or it could be an uncle um, but in some cases it could be a patron uh, so finding good mentors also play a, a role or the mentors finding mentees thank you, uh, thank you. does that answer your question deepa or do you have something yes, else to add yeah. please okay. no this is this is helpful i mean of course some of this resonates in our current time right but what professor rama is saying is the situation as the context changes as society changes perhaps what is required from society to help encourage and and hold up these people is perhaps different um, not necessarily the same but yeah it's interesting thank you okay thank you are there any further questions great if no then i would like to uh, i think there is there is a hand i am not able to see the hands being in on yes, my yes so uh, yeah i can see that uh, satya yeah, i have suggestion yeah please go ahead yeah. and my hand is raised can i ask a question yeah yeah please go ahead please go ahead it's an observation and a question together uh, the observation that uh, nisha then professor rama and others have made is that uh, um, you know in promoting women over the years and the role that men have played in being mentors and so on so there is an observation that they must have also been subject to, to some kind of social ostrac ostracization and so on but what was interesting is um, in your uh, reading of the literature and in preparing for these presentations have any of the speakers seen 
women mentors have taken an active role in promoting other women or serving as uh, active role models and directly supporting other women. If, are there any examples in the literature that you've come across? Well, there are no, this is uh, Dr. Rama here. So there are no specific examples that I have come across. This does not mean that there are no examples because I have not looked into the length and breadth and width of what's available. But you can find examples like this during the Sangam literature period where, you know, women uh, supported other women scholars uh, uh, to excel. Although, of, of my, uh, you know, I'm not able to uh, recollect any specific names, but I can get back to you with specific names. Can I ask? From Chandra Shekhar, uh, he wants to ask a question. Uh, yeah, Ram. Uh, yeah, please, please go ahead. Yeah, it's not a question. It's a basically a suggestion for uh, not only for the speakers but for the all in your members. So, how can we take the things forward uh, from here? Uh, as I mean, from the Inyas point of view, is there any thought from the speakers or any of the members? I was about to include that in my concluding remarks, but I would leave the floor open to any of the speakers to add to this. Please go ahead. If anybody wants to respond to Chandra's remark of how to take it forward from here. Okay, it's good that we have all had all these things in the past, but as Inyas, how to take it forward? Do we want to take it forward? If we want, how do we want, how do we have to take it forward? Any thoughts, please? I think information should be made available. So, you know, uh, so people are first, you know, uh, they are introduced to these uh, uh, women scholars who had excelled and, you know, the kind of hardships some of them have gone through and how even some of the people, women scholars from the privileged class, they also had to go through hardships. So I think these information should be made available. And then, you know, one can think of how best to use this for our future generation and for the current women scholars as well and men scholars. Yeah, rightly so, given the digital era that we live in, access to information shouldn't be a problem. But as I was mentioning after the end of just uh, Professor Rama's talk, if we type in Wikipedia, I mean, you can do it right away. The number of names that you find from India, Indian soil is hardly any compared to you know, people, women of different ages from Rome, from, from other different countries. So access to information is the first starting point. We can start from that. We have to do internal uh, uh, introspection on how to make this access of information more interesting and more accessible to one and all. So if there are no further questions, uh, I Rama, would like... Can I, yeah. can I add something? This is sure. Mahesh. Yeah, please, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. So, uh, you know, reading... Just one second. Yeah. I'm saying that, you know, in... Uh, reading about women in science, I came across the statistics that uh, there are a lot of women who are, you know, imparting science education in India. Actually, women, women make the majority of, uh, you know, uh, the educators of STEM education in India, but there are, there is a huge dearth of women who are actually doing science, who are doing research. And I do see in my own experience that, uh, you know, we have a lot of uh, students who are pursuing PhD, but after PhD, there is a huge uh, drop in women who are continuing with their postdoc and actually becoming uh, scientists. So I think that is something that Inyas uh, definitely should look at. You know, how can we motivate uh, these uh, women who are actually, you know, doing PhD, but then they uh, leak out of the pipeline and then they do not end up doing postdoc or joining as faculty. So that is something to think about. Yes, a good point. But I think Professor Rama also mentioned that four kind, four kind of scholarship. And that's what uh, one question was also asked by Satya Vrata, that we are more gravitating towards institutionalized scholarship. And in response, rightly, Professor Rama said that it is onus lies on us to look all 360, 720 degrees around. There are, in, there are numerable unschooled scholars as well. So 
uh, that the first slide about the four different type of scholarship is indeed a good thing to ponder about. But yes, of course, for institutional scholarship as well, India's beacon institution by itself should also take some um, concrete steps. Agreed. If there are no further questions, I will just quickly sum up and just have, have a small presentation that I prepared uh, going by the kind of discussion and questions that we had. So I brought, put, put together a few, uh, just two or three slides, it, uh, which may answer the question about, you know, the kind of environment that these women lived or what were the support system and also on the question of were there any women uh, supporters, women scholars who supported other women scholars. So I will just uh, present it. Let me just open my presentation here. I am not able to present it from here. Never mind. I, I don't know whether I am not able to share share my presentation from here. Ram, you can Ram. just click on the arrow. I am sorry about it. I will just send the presentation to Rajendra. In the meantime, I will be just talking about it. So, um, this is on the music box. Just give me one second. Ram, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, I think you can uh, click on the arrow and then select your uh, PPT. Should work. Rajendra, I am yes. just sending the PPT over the WhatsApp. In the INEAS WhatsApp group. Oh. So maybe you can send the email. Yeah, better to send me an email. I will immediately uh, share it. I put it in the WhatsApp group. I am downloading it. I will share. I am sorry about this glitch. Um, but it's because it is some verses are written. So I just want to have it shared with all. That's the only purpose of it. So I mean. Uh, is it visible, Ram, at the presentation? Yes, it's there. Yeah, it's there. Yes, of course. Please make it in slide mode. Visible in slide mode now? No. Okay, give me a second. I'll share again. So the while she is sharing it, the whole genesis actually started because Ineas had celebrated, had proudly celebrated the Marie Curie uh, commemorating her anniversary. So indeed, she is one of the unique scientists who was awarded two Nobel prizes. She had, in fact, literally donated her devoted her entire life and sacrificed her life literally for the cause of science. So indeed we have to be celebrated it. But then a thought struck in me that um, are there other women scholars as well? If not, of course, the, the metric to measure the impact is, is multi, it's, it's there, it's available in multiple uh, ways. Nobel Prize or Bhatnagar Award, a number of citations, a number of student followers, so on and so forth. So, but then there are indeed other women scholars as well. So why not uh, have a look at them? So that's how the thought process started in me. And in February, when we had the annual general body meeting, so uh, I remember still Satyavarta was sitting beside me and we both were discussing. And immediately we said that in this year, we should do something. And then right away when the mid-year meeting was announced, I am very happy and glad that the core committee and uh, the chair Chandrasekhar thought about this topic and gave us an opportunity to put together. So, I mean, I, this remark as it appears, that if India appeared as a palimpsest to those uh, who wrote on her history in the yester years, history of education in India as an equally competent palimpsest spanning thousands of years, if not more. So, what I mean by this is, when we actually look at the history of Indian education or Indian science or Indian technology, we need to consciously look at it from three different stages. One, prior to the Islamic invasion, one, during the Islamic invasion, and in fact, four different stages prior to Islamic invasion, 
during the Islamic invasion, colonial period, and the post-colonial period. Of course, this year, uh, there was one more, one more reinforcing factor for me to put together the session, was that it was declared as a Women in Science Year in the, on the National Science Day. And DST also had uh, celebrated famous scientists like Janaki Ammar, to, uh, all the names are not coming on the top of my head this year, uh, at the right at this at this moment, but then it had named scholarships in the name of very famous Indian women scholars. So rightly so, I thought in India we should have this discussion, and that's how we had it. So if you look at the history, we have sometimes are obsessed with with one particular period of history, and when I say history, I'm over encompassing all the fields. So when we discuss about women scholars, yes, indeed, there were women scholars who have been discussed, but they were restricted to a very specific time frame in the last 100 years or in the last 150 years. So uh, as Professor Rama also said, there's a, there is a uh, the clinical depth of information. So somewhere we should start, and that's how we started. Please move on to the next slide. So in uh, talking about the environment in which people lived or what could have been the sources of inspiration for them, who nurtured them. I just want to quickly, in my three minutes that I have, I just want to quickly name three names and talk about uh, very briefly about their uh, work. Bijika, she is from Kashmir. Again, uh, 7th to 9th century. We do not know exact date. And like most of our Indian scholars, none of their dates has, are precisely known. Again, a scope of much of historical research work to be done. Uh, she is a renowned poetess. I mean, the, look at the temerity with which she composes her poem. This poem that you have seen right in front of your eyes, it's a mockery or a satirical take on another poet called Dandi. And Dandi, those of you who are little read in Sanskrit literature, that there is a there's a big story that is told about that there was a congregation of all the poets and uh, none other than Saraswati was the presiding adjudicator. So the competition was between Kalidas and Dandi. Dandi, uh, at the end of it, Saraswati pronounced that Kavir Dandi, Kavir Dandi, Kavir Dandi. Me means Dandi, there's no other poet, other than, no great poet other than Dandi. But then Kalidasa got flummoxed. He said, but what about me? Then that the story goes that uh, she says that Kalida says none other than him, the, herself. But then coming to here, Vichika, she has that temerity to say, because in one of the uh, uh, invocations of Dandi's work, Dandi says that Saraswati is Sarva Shukla, all white Saraswati. Vichika was a dark skinned woman. So she got offended and she says, she says that perhaps Dandi doesn't know about my existence, Vijika, and that's why she has he has called Saraswati to be all white. Okay, so I don't have to dwell deeper into the meaning, but I just want to uh, highlight the temerity with which the tone and the tenor with which she composes. So this could not have been possible if the surrounding ambience or the uh, environment environment in which she lived actually promoted that. Please next slide. Vikatita Nimba, again from a region in Kashmir, from the same era of 7th to 9th century. I am laying stress on the 7th to 9th century. Why? Because this is pre-Islamic invasion period. Okay. She was another great scholar, woman uh, poetess, well versed in uh, all the uh, fine nuances of Sanskrit poesy uh, literature of that period, starting from Nati Shastra of Bharat Muni. Look at this work. She is commenting on her own husband and her own fate. She says that she is married to a dullard, to a moron, who is not able to pronounce even the simple consonants correctly. He pronounces masham for masam and shakas yasya sakasham tatsya sakasam. So like that. Ushtray lumpati shambharamva tasmai datta vikatita nimba. So if there were, I mean, look at the, again the temerity, the tone and the tenor with which these people have, these are not you know, cherry picking to just show, highlight few things that they have done. This is just a tip of the iceberg. One can look at their work. And here I must also comment that indeed people have looked at their works. 
in the last 100 years, in the last 50, 60 years, people have looked at their work. But the, again, the lens with which you look at their work is also important. The lens, unfortunately, and this is my personal opinion here, unfortunately, the lens with which these work have been looked upon are purely the modernist lens, the presentism, or the feminist lens, or the postmodernist lens. I'll not go deeper into that. Last slide that I have, please go ahead. This is on the topic um, of, uh, this is about Mangalamba. She is now in the medieval era, I mean, just before the colonial era started, or the, at the end of uh, the Islamic uh, the period, uh, around 16th century or 15th century around. Mangalamba, I mean, I must tell about her family as well. She is a wife of one Ratna, Ratna Kheta Dikshita. Her son-in-law is Apaya Dikshita, the very well-known Sanskrit scholar. She had a son and a daughter. The daughter was Achamma, and the son's name I'm forgetting. I have to refer to the book. But then she was known to be a, a scholar who was promoting other scholars as well. So she had promoted her own. Of course, her family was entirely scholarly. But then uh, hagiographers have mentioned that she has promoted other women scholars as well. And as I mentioned, Achamma, her daughter, is also a renowned Sanskrit scholar. So this is one, one beautiful verse. You look at the extent of poetic imagination or the intellect, uh, impromptu ex exhibition of intelligence that is very much shining forth in this particular verse, which I don't think I'll have to read out and explain to you. So with these three examples, I hope, and with my colleagues and Professor Rama's presentation, I'm sure we all have got enough impetus and inputs to mull further and uh, to also think very consciously and concretely to think how to take it forward and to make the information about our wonderful women scholars from the past as well. So with this, I think we are on time, ex just that I've exceeded by three minutes, and I think uh, uh, now by four minutes. So we bring to, uh, we come to a close of this session. I thank my, uh, first again, I, I express my thanks once again to Professor Rama, for having graciously acceded to our request and to have presented. I will fail in my duty if I will not thank my panelists, Dr. Ashwini, Rajini and Fatima, who also very readily uh, agreed to my request and they had put in their time, effort for pre preparing this uh, presentation today. My thanks are indeed once again due to the chair of INIAS as well as to the core committee and the organizing committee of this mid-year meeting for having given us this wonderful opportunity to present. Thank you, one and all. Okay. Ravindra, you want to have a closure? Yeah, I think so. We are done with this session. And uh, we have a break of uh, two and a half hours. We will meet again at 3 p.m. Sandra, you would like to say something? Yeah, I uh, just request uh, everyone to log in by 2.50. And uh, well, thanks Ram for sharing this session. It was wonderful talks from everyone, including Professor Rama. And uh, I think it went really well. And uh, I'm sure uh, Inyas will take this discussion and uh, theme of the session forward in many other ways. So once again, uh, thank and uh, let's rejoin at 2.50 uh, p.m. for the Inyas general session. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.